was their turn up the bat, you know? Yeah, I hear you. So, so no, oh, oh, that's a sports analogy. There were no sports analogies at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do sports analogies, and they didn't either. That's, so. Yeah, that's funny because I, because in the MLS and soccer, Toronto lost to Seattle um, in the finals last year. So I texted Jack and Dino about that, and he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So <laughs> <laughs> I heard that when you guys finished Been a Sun, you played it on the speakers, you guys were dancing or something? Like, what What happened there exactly? There's, there are tables in the back of the studio where the advertising people sit and, you know, conduct their other business with their laptops and have little ginchy lunches and things like that. Um, and there's an old story about when Humble Pie's record was done, they danced on the console hmm. and actually really fucked up the console. And I won't try to tell you that story that's in the internet. Uh, but Nirvana said, well, if we can't dance on the console, can we dance on the schmincy tables that the ad people eat lunch off of? And I said, sure. And so we all jumped up on tables and danced around and played the track a couple of times, you know. Uh, <laughs> they have been as fun maybe three four times for the high volume and and, and act like we we won <laughs> we awesome. recorded as long and mixed it yay <laughs> so do you remember anything in particular when it came to recording that song a bit of sun like was there anything that sticks out in terms of how you recorded that song no i mean they they hadn't got a chance to dink around you know with that kind of gear and so i think a few other interviews i mentioned playing with this giant digital reverb that you know hmm. you could make things sound preposterous with it so we we, we experimented with it making making it sound preposterous for a little while before we, uh and then also it, it was a trick because of the bass solo hmm. because the whole song gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then there's a bass solo so it's the uh, the last chorus it's it always sounds a little shitty because it has it's a step down from the bass solo which is very very frenetic and uh kind of eats up the whole audio spectrum. So so that was a bit of a drag trying to, you know, get all of that to work. I was and I still think I didn't do a very good job of that. But that's what we have. Yeah, I think it sounds great, man. So what was it like hey. recording Chris Novoselic's bass playing? how was he working within the studio? Just totally cool. You know, I think the the bass solo was an overdub, though we put it alongside the one movie track, so it just was really thick and and exactly the same way as he played it twice. No, he, and, and and what was wrong with his his trip? It just the bass was a little fucked up, and the amp was a little fucked up. But there was one good speaker and one good pickup, and and so you know it sounded good. But then the unfortunate thing was he really was trying to get it, his shit fixed for the session, and had been running around for a couple of days, you know, because he knew we had to get into the studio, and was very nervous about that. So he meant to have it together. He worked hard to have it together, but. Uh, it just, you know, there's only so much you can do. I hear you. Uh, you were saying that the reason that their gear was damaged is because at the end of their shows, they would often smash their equipment, right? Right. So just because this is something about Nirvana I've always found fascinating. It's if it's going to severely impact their ability to record, why do they keep smashing their gear anyways? Like, do you know why they kept doing that? No. It's kind of funny. So was there anything funny about the sessions? Like when you were recording them, like, are, are there any funny memories you have from that time with them? Well, this is not really funny, but um, there was a toilet in the middle of the studio. So if you had to relieve yourself, you didn't have to leave the building. You could jump into a little improvised toilet mm -hmm. <laughs> and it had bad wallpaper with birds and musical notes on a staff. And Chad came out of the bathroom going, does anybody ever play those notes? <laughs> what, <laughs> what does it actually sound like when you... What's the, what's the wallpaper? And he says, is it, is it whistle while you poop? Or, you know, he was, anyway, that was a bad Chad joke from the session. <laughs> How um, was Chad as a drummer in general? Did you enjoy working with him? Oh, yeah. He's a great drummer and doesn't get uh, his, his due. Mm -hmm. He's got a, a looser kind of, I guess, a hippie feel or something like that. But, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, he sounded great in Nirvana. I think that version of In Bloom that he did was really, really good. Mm -hmm. maybe as good as their version with Dave, you know, we want to just talk about opinions or something like that. But no, I think Chad's an amazing drummer. He's a really good guitar player. He's a songwriter. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I agree. I feel like Chad, 
really doesn't get the due. I feel like he should have been in the Hall of Fame, quite frankly, in my opinion. But that's just, you know, that's a separate topic altogether, I suppose. Yeah, when things get that big, there's all kinds of, you know, yeah. should have, should have, this or that. Uh, you know, everybody means well. So what was the chemistry like between the three guys in the studio? Were they, like, what was it like to actually work with them, essentially? It was fun. And they had a great three-way sense of humor for a band uh being where they were from and what they were doing and the money that was being spent on them and their previous recording sessions and all of that getting to record uh in a 24 track was a big deal that was the first time they'd been in a proper 24 track which was the industry standard you know uh full fidelity you know wide tape mixing console mm -hmm. all that stuff i mean they did a great record with jack uh, I think they did a better record with Jack than they did with me, but uh, they were nervous. It was Kurt's band, but he wasn't an asshole, but he was directing things a little bit. I think some of the recordings of, uh, of Polly's, you know, have, have Chad starting the song a few different times because they uh, it wasn't exactly catching. I mentioned that in an interview once, but it wasn't a problem. It just was them trying to, you know, work out an arrangement. And when it was over with, it was everyone was really happy. <laughs> so, so that it was a very quick session. We had two evenings to do five songs, and we got, you know, five songs recorded and two finished. They talked a little bit about, you know, having an advance from sub pop, and you know what the second record was. I think they, I, I mean, this sounds silly but they said oh great so we'll do the second record with you right here this will be great we've got it in advance and obviously the second record was never mind and it happened a long way away after yeah. a lot of other shit happened but uh but uh, uh as far as a sense of humor i mean they did they just had a good time they didn't do you know send up some other people's songs or anything like that but it, yeah it was funny and also you know the fact that they were there and they were like this new baby band on Sub Pop and all of a sudden they're in a big studio up on Capitol Hill. That was funny. Hmm. That was that was already ironic and weird enough that uh, that the, you didn't have to say much more <laughs> than that for without them understanding kind of the, the weirdness of the situation and all of that. So it was it was a good time. We had fun. It was, you know, I I, I um at the risk of stepping into my own persona uh, or narcissism or whatever. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, both Kurt and Chris were big fans of Beat Happening. And so getting to getting to work with me uh, was, I, uh, I think, a big deal for them at the time. Hmm. So I often don't really take that into account, but I, I think they yeah, they wanted to make good recording because they're friends of Screaming Trees and the friends beat happening and and a lot of other their friends that made really good recordings with me. 